Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and welcome to Vampire Reviews. October is finally upon us. You know what that means. It's Interview with the Vampire Month. Are you excited? Are you scared? Over our many years discussing vampires together here on Vampire Reviews, I have made no secret of my obsession with Anne Rice's A Vampire Chronicles. It's kind of my thing. And 15 books, two movies, a stack of graphic novels, and a Broadway musical later, we now have a brand new TV series adaptation on AMC. And if you have the paid streaming service AMC+, Plus, that means you get to watch two episodes on launch and we'll get the rest of the seven episodes a week ahead of time from everyone else watching on cable. If you've watched my other videos discussing the development of this TV show, you have been well primed for all the very many changes it makes to the source material. Showrunner Rollin Jones has explained that they didn't want to just make another version of the book since the book and the 1994 movie already exist. Instead, AMC tasked him with making a third thing, something brand new for the people who don't know the books very well and for people who know them inside and out. Third thing, well, more like sixth thing at this point, but okay. But even though the TV show has completely reworked the story that the vampire Louis tells in his interview into an alternate universe version set in 1910, where he is a black Creole brothel owner during the height of New Orleans Jazz Age, the showrunners have promised over and over that the heart of the Chronicles is still there, and that the show will be filled with Easter eggs, dialogue straight from the books, and other nods and mentions to Anne Rice and the source material, especially when it comes to how Lestat's character was fleshed out over the course of the Chronicles. Yes, they have assured us that there will, in fact, be some Anne Rice in this Anne Rice's interview with the Vampire TV show. Lucky us! But, of course, you can't make such huge changes to the story and the characters without it having a domino effect. And the result is that the show explores vastly different themes with its vampire metaphors than the books do. So, what we are going to do here tonight, and for several nights, is go through the show episode by episode and, well, talk about all that. Spoilers ahead! All the spoilers. So, if you haven't watched episode one yet, go ahead and do that now. I'll wait. It dropped four days early for some reason, so put a pin in this video and come back to me once you've seen it in all of its increasing wonder. If you watch the show on cable, you'll get the edited down TV appropriate version, but if you watch on AMC+, Plus, it's a special extra long version of the first episode with all the good stuff. Unfortunately, it seems like only episode one will get this treatment and the rest of the show will be regular length episodes for both platforms. But if you keep watching on AMC+, Plus, you will get all the rest of the episodes a week ahead of time. Episode one, Throes of Increasing Wonder. We were told at San Diego Comic-Con that the episode titles will be quotes pulled from the original book. And this one isn't quite, but we will get back to that. We start off by being introduced to Daniel Malloy, the boy from Interview with the Vampire, who interviewed Louis in 1973, now all grown up 50 years later, played by Eric Bogosian, vegging out at home during COVID quarantine amid evidence of a life very well lived. Our first big change. In the books, after young Daniel interviews Louis, he transcribes the tapes of their interview and publishes the interview as the book Interview with the Vampire under the pseudonym Anne Rice, and it actually exists in-universe. He then goes down to New Orleans to try to find Lestat, because now Daniel wants to be a vampire. At the end of his first interview, he asked Louis to make him a vampire, and Louis got mad about that and attacked him, drank his blood, and left him for dead. And when we see old Daniel's neck in the TV show, he does have a scar from that attack. Book Daniel fails to find Lestat in New Orleans because Lestat is buried underground, sleeping for 50 years, and instead he finds the vampire Armand, who's been squatting in Lestat's house waiting for Lestat to wake up. Armand makes Daniel into his human pet slash lover, and they have a tumultuous relationship for 12 years that drives Daniel almost to death and madness until Armand finally makes him a vampire in 1984. The story of their horrific romance, called The Devil's Minion, is a significant portion of the book The Queen of the Damned and a huge fan-favorite part of canon, but none of that happens in the show. 
This time, Louis took the tapes after he bit Daniel, and Daniel never had the chance to publish the interview, never met Armand, never got mixed up with vampires again. He grew up and had a fabulous career, and now he is almost 70 years old, and things are waning, and he's resorted to teaching journalism classes over Zoom during COVID while he's battling Parkinson's disease. The showrunners say that the reason they wanted to put the interview in 2022 instead of 1973 is because the movie did the same thing, set the interview in 1994, which is when it came out. So once again, they bump it up to contemporary times. They also said that it was very important to them that the interview go deeper than it does in the book in order to incorporate a more well-rounded picture of Lestat that Anne Rice developed in the book's sequels as he ended up becoming the hero of the series. So... They wanted the interviewer to be better than the passive, naive boy in the book. They wanted a hard-hitting journalist who would ask intense questions to get Louis to tell a less one-sided story and challenge any discrepancies and contradictions in his narrative. And also, they wanted his interactions with Louis during the framing device scenes to be compelling with an aggressive, dynamic relationship between the two of them because the show keeps cutting back to them over the course of seven episodes, and if they were just sitting at a table talking calmly, that would get pretty dull fast. Instead of just making up a new character for this aggressive interviewer, though, they decided they would revere canon by making it the same boy. Now all grown up and much better at his job, revere canon. And thus, here is our first big change in vampire themes in the show. Here, Instead of the vampire representing the destruction of Daniel's existence, the spiral into madness, the glimpse of power that transcends humanity, leading him to an obsession akin to addiction that leaves him a ruined thing. For this Daniel, his experience with the vampire serves as a wake-up call, a second chance. When he met Louis, he was a drugged-out slacker, but after his flirtation with death, he turned his life around, defeated his addiction, and rose to success. As Daniel unwraps the box of tapes that mysteriously appears in his locked mailbox without an address or postage on it, he does it over a jigsaw puzzle he's been working on of this painting. The Fall of the Rebel Angels, done by Peter Bruegel, done in the style of a Hieronymus Bosch, depicting demons present not in some metaphysical terrain of horror, but in the real world of people and landscapes. So symbolic. Vampires exist in the real world, walking among us. Louis, played by Jacob Anderson, invites Daniel to his home to redo their failed interview because this time he does want the book published. He wants his story out there so that the world knows vampires exist and to offer truth and reconciliation for the unfair and incomplete story he told last time that painted Lestat as a complete villain. And Daniel sees the chance to grab the brass ring, and have one last groundbreaking success before his career is totally washed up or he dies from Parkinson's disease, whichever comes first. Louis lives in Dubai now. And this is because in the modern technological world, it's much harder for vampires to exist in secret. This is a concept that Anne Rice explored in the Prince Lestat books, which she described as being inspired by wondering how vampires would deal with cell phones and surveillance and the internet. And like Daniel says in his TV commercial for his Zoom class, the world of news and journalism has been changed significantly by the fact that everyone carries the internet around in their pockets now. The show chose Dubai for Louis' high-tech vampire home because the Emiratis have the strictest privacy laws on the planet and it was a logical place where a vampire could best keep his immortal existence secret. He lives in the penthouse apartment of the Al Sharif Towers and has a huge staff of human servants who are utterly devoted to him. This penthouse is extremely stark and modern and a complete opposite of the various ways Louis lives in the books. Our first introduction to the show's new reimagining of their version of Louis. Instead of living in a moldering shack with no electricity or shacking up in the opulent residences of his vampire buddies filled with antiques to rival the Palace of Versailles, this Louis is thoroughly modern. 
also wearing very casual modern black clothes. He is famously unfashionable in his clothing choices in the book often, but he, he usually chooses garments in an old-fashioned style because Anne Rice's vampires always cling to the aesthetic of their mortal years in dress and decor. One thing that is the same as in the books, though, is that he collects art, and his walls here are adorned with paintings he's acquired through his long life and travels over the world. One of the first things Daniel asks him is how he can be awake during the day and standing in front of the apartment's giant plate glass windows. In the books, the vampires go unconscious the second the sun rises and cannot wake up until it sets again. But the show has changed that rule, and now they can be awake during the day and even go about in daylight as long as it's not direct sunlight. Louis demonstrates this by having his personal assistant remove the UV filter from one of the windows, letting a sunbeam in. Louis has no problem walking directly up to the edge of the sunbeam, or for a clothed part of his body to touch it, but as soon as he sticks his bare arm in the beam, his flesh instantly begins to turn into ash. Now, of course, the first thing I'm thinking is that uh, this has to be like Chekhov's sunbeam, right? There's no reason for the show to have changed this lore about vampires being able to be awake during the day if it's not going to come back into play later in some significant way, right? I mentioned Louis' assistant, and this is a new character named Rashid. He is a strict, no-nonsense fellow who Louis treats like a servant, but is perhaps more. I have theories about Rashid. We'll have to come back to that. But anyway, now that Daniel is old and aggressive, he doesn't stand for Louis' condescension and insists they begin the interview immediately. Louis spins a tale, taking us back to 1910 New Orleans. And the first thing he tells us is that his father has been dead five years and he is now in charge of the family trust for his mother and siblings. Their generational wealth originally came from a sugar plantation owned by his great-grandfather, who was a free man of color who enslaved people who looked like him but did not have his privileges. But Louis's father squandered all their money before he died, so Louis saved the family from going bankrupt by getting into the prostitution business. Daniel outright calls him a pimp. Louis says that it was the only business that a man of his complexion could make a righteous living at in 1910 during the era of Storyville, the very short period of time New Orleans had a legal red light district. Last year, when the news broke that Louis' character in the show was being changed from a white plantation owner in 1791 to a black brothel owner in 1910, there was a lot of discourse about depicting slave owners as protagonists on contemporary television and whether it was responsible or not of the show to remove the plantation from his character backstory. Turns out, they ended up giving us both. So, not only is Louis vampirically earning his wealth by profiting off other people's bodies in his brothels, he's also still benefited from the privilege of his ancestors profiting off slavery. Louis here owns eight brothels on the poor, rough side of Storyville because he's black and the brothels in the fancy district are largely whites only. He tells us that because his neighborhood is so rough, he's always under pressure to look and act tough. A far cry from the genteel and sophisticated Louis of the books, this Louis is a foul-mouthed, cigar-chomping wise guy who even pulls a knife on his own brother, who he tells us he loves more than anyone on earth, pulls a knife on him during a street fight to keep up the tough guy image while he's in public. But in other settings, we see Louis code-switching between the loving son and brother with his family and the deferential boot-licking discreet Negro with the white men he does business with. Even the nuances of his Southern accent change depending on who he's talking to and which hat he has to wear for any given situation. Because he's also at odds with how his prostitution business conflicts with his Catholic upbringing and a closeted gay man in denial about his own sexuality, he doesn't feel he fits in any of these segments of his life, even though he plays them all masterfully. He's angry. He's frustrated. He's alone, practically outside of humanity already. And this combination of traits is what the showrunners thought would make him the kind of person a vampire like Lestat would instantly be attracted to. Because another big change here, instead of Lestat being a 
relatively new a vampire, just starting out his vampire life and rushing into things, making tons of reckless mistakes and his youthful impetuosity. Now, Lestat is 150 years old when he meets Louis, and they figured he would take more time and put more consideration into choosing his immortal companion. After Lestat, played by Sam Reed, witnesses Louis' fight with his brother, he does some classic vampire stalking and finds out Louis has a favorite sex worker, Lily, who he likes to delude himself into thinking he's straight with. Because Louis is a brothel owner, he gets special privileges to be allowed to go into the White's Only Brothel to visit Lily at the Fair Play Saloon, owned by Tom Anderson, who is a character based on a real historical figure, a political boss and state legislature known as the unofficial Mayor of Storyville. In this fictionalized rendition of Tom Anderson's saloon, we also have another real-life historical American icon leading the house band. The pianist and composer Jelly Roll Morton, who claimed to have invented jazz in 1902. Although Jelly Roll did perform at brothels in New Orleans during the earlier era of Storyville, the show kind of fudges the timeline around to have him still here playing in Tom Anderson's very own saloon as a splash of historical color. When Louis shows up to visit Lily for another night of proving how straight he is, Lestat's already there knocking her socks off with his vampire charms as an excuse to meet Louis. He proceeds to both flatter Louis effusively, calling him handsome, most agreeable personality, his destiny, and to also humiliate him with repeated emasculation in a way that makes Louis both hate him and want him at once. And Lestat does all this while smoking up a storm. Yes, the vampires smoke in this show, not just to pretend to be human in front of mortals, they do it when they are alone too. Another change from the books where the appeal of all stimulants is completely lost to vampires and they have no interest in anything other than blood. But I guess the show needed to show us how cool a stat is, so now he smokes like a bad boy. This cock contest seduction tactic of Lestat's is different but it does serve to give us a lot more insight into the show's version of Lestat's character than the book, where their first encounter is Lestat simply attacking Louis, draining him of his blood and leaving him for dead. In the book, Lestat then comes back the next night as Louis is dying in bed, introduces himself properly, tells Louis he's a vampire, and blows his mind with all the great things being a vampire can be. Or at least, so Louis tells us, Whatever Lestat actually says isn't written in the book, and I've been looking forward to seeing how this show fleshes that speech out. Lestat then tells Louis he'll come back the next night and let Louis decide if he wants to be a vampire too. Uh, he forces Louis to watch him kill someone so he knows what he's getting into, but even though Louis is horrified, he still says yes, and Lestat gives him the dark gift. Three nights, that's it. And it's not till Louis already past the point of no return that he finds out anything about Lestat's true personality. In the show, they get to spend about a month together courting. The next time Louis meets him is at Tom Anderson's high stakes poker game. Louis is the only black person there and Tom invited him to suggest Louis become business partners with another white man for a new brothel. But that Louis do all of the work for only 10% of the profit. While Lestat's listening to this conversation, he's pretending to be terrible at cards, playing the part of the clueless foreigner. But he shows his hand when he stops time in the middle of the conversation, because that's a thing he can do in this show. He can stop time. No, it's not explained. No, that's not from any of the books. At first, I thought it was just supposed to be a representation of how fast he was going at vampire speed while the humans and everything remained still. But when he does it, everyone and everything is frozen except Louis. I did think that maybe this could be an aspect of the spell gift, that this might be happening in Louis's head as some sort of split-second fever dream delusion, but the way the power is used again later, I think Lestat can just literally stop time now. While time is stopped, Lestat admonishes Louis for not knowing his own worth, revealing how valuable he thinks Louis is and how appalling he finds racism against black people in America. And this is enough to win Louis over that they start hanging out. Just as friends, though, it's not dating, they're not, they're not courting, because Louis still believes he is straight. Louis doesn't know yet that Lestat's a vampire. He thinks he just has some kind of magic powers. I mean... 
It's New Orleans, after all, magic abounds. The Mayfair witches even get a name drop in this episode as living down the street from Louie's family home. Plenty of brooms down the street at the Mayfair sisters home. <laughs> He's calling me a witch, Mama. The Mayfair witches are actual witches and exist in the shared Anne Rice universe in the books of their own that interweave with the Vampire Chronicles. And they're getting their own show as well, coming out next year. Lestat is shown to be a fabulously wealthy. And while he and Louis are not dating, he throws money around like it means nothing. This is a big change from their initial dynamic in the book, where Louis believes that Lestat wants to use him for his wealth, only making Louis his vampire companion because Lestat wanted his fabulous house and privileges and for Louis to be subservient to him. Here, that user dynamic of their relationship is entirely eliminated. And Louis knows that Lestat wants nothing from him other than his company. So the vampire here doesn't represent a leeching force or even a manipulatively alluring one, but instead a genuine love that's patient and even nurturing despite its mysteriousness. And for Louis, who feels at odds with everyone around him in so many ways, being the object of real love feels as inexplicable as magic powers. When his sister hears that Louis has been catting around with some white man, she insists Louis bring his new European not-boyfriend home for dinner to meet the family. And this is the night that turns Louis's world upside down. First of all, Lestat starts talking a lot about his past, his own backstory. Things about himself and his childhood he never told Louis in the book, but that he has no problem just tossing out there now. And we get several key details from his autobiography, The Vampire Lestat. He mentions his mother and how she gave him every advantage in life, which includes uh, dogs, guns, and escaping his horrible childhood home to go to Paris, which incidentally is where he became a vampire. Thanks, Mom. When Louis's obsessively religious brother Paul, who thinks God speaks to him through a family of birds in his head, asks Lestat what his relationship is with Louis, causing a moment of gay panic to go around the dinner table, Lestat says they're discussing investment opportunities. Yes, to Lestat, making an immortal companion would be a serious investment. Then Paul asks Lestat if he's one with Christ. And Lestat tells a slightly altered version of his backstory of when he went off to monastery school at the age of 12 and fell so in love with how superior it was from his chaotic home life that he wanted to become a priest. But this would have been beneath his noble-born dignity, so his oafish father and brothers dragged him out of school and punished him brutally for daring to have dreams. So now he is a staunch atheist. Thank you. In the show, uh, he describes studying a whole lot more scripture than he actually got the chance to in the book, where he remained illiterate until he was a vampire. So now he is much more educated in his origins, again changing the dynamic between him and Louis, where in the book, Louis looked down on him as an unintellectual peasant. But as his atheism is apparently a particular sore spot for Lestat, he begins to use his powers on Louis's family, freezing them in place while he loses his temper and starts ranting about how God doesn't exist. Louis screams at him to not do that shit with his family, and Lestat immediately apologizes. Louis's got him whipped already. Louis seems to forget about this huge red flag pretty quickly, and he walks Lestat home to his townhouse. Earlier, Lestat said that as soon as he fell in love with Louis at first sight, he went straight to the French Quarter to buy a townhouse and settle in New Orleans permanently. The house he lives in on the Rue Royale is an actual historical building called the Gallier House that Anne Rice mentioned she used as inspiration for Louis and Lestat's home in the books. It's not supposed to be the exact house in the book because in reality, it's a two-story townhouse. And in the book, she wrote it as a single-story apartment above a tailor shop with a totally different interior layout. But the show decided to make the inspiration literal and filmed on location at the real house and in set replicas of its interior. Another change here is that instead of the house being one of Louis's previously owned properties that he and Lestat move into together years after Louis becomes a vampire, Lestat is already living there and it belongs to him. 
Lestat is much more independent here, not at all struggling to find his footing in the new world like he was in the book and desperate to find someone to help him get settled. Also, just practically, the show couldn't say Louis owned this house because it was nearly impossible for a black man to buy property in the French Quarter at that time. So once again, this adjusts the power dynamic between Louis and Lestat, where Louis has no reason to feel Lestat is dependent on him, using him for his money and connections or mooching off of him in any way. While they walk there, Lestat compares Louis's repressed ways to how freely his oversharing religious brother expresses himself, sympathetic for how Louis hides his sensitive side out of shame. When Lestat told Louis's family earlier about how he took Louis to the opera, Louis lied and said that he didn't like it, but really, he was weeping when the curtain fell. Lestat tries to encourage Louis to let go of this toxic masculinity, but Louis feels too trapped by his life circumstances. The example of the opera is especially significant because the opera they attended was Yolanta by Tchaikovsky, which is about a blind person who's been living a lie, a false existence their whole life, and at the end of the story miraculously gains sight to realize the truth of who they really are and the gloriousness of true life around them. This is the kind of revelation Lestat wants to bring to Louis's existence, to open his eyes with the world of the vampire and give Louis something meaningful to live for compared to his current struggles and shame. When Louis takes another swig of his flask, Lestat tells him, Drink up, my good man. The Earth's a Savage Garden. Savage Garden is a reference to Lestat's philosophy of vampiric existence that he develops in The Vampire Lestat. But in the books, the garden is not the earth. The garden is a state of being, a state of perceiving the path through eternity, and a philosophy of morality where the only laws of existence are aesthetic laws. Here, the show has made the Savage Garden literally apply to uh, the wilds of the natural world, which is a much shallower understanding of the metaphysics deconstructed in the book. But maybe they didn't want it to be that deep, and this little throwaway line is supposed to count as an Easter egg. The way the show Martyrs promised so many Easter eggs and references to all 15 chronicles throughout the show... So far, all I've seen are incorporations of, like, the established backstory, but we'll keep looking. Since Lestat has decided that being taken home to have dinner with Louis's folks finally counts as a real date, he invites Louis inside for a nightcap. Louis tries to decline, he's already a bit drunk, but Lestat's invited over Louis's favorite sex worker, Lily, and this surprise is enough to get Louis in the door. Once inside, Lestat makes them drinks and plays a music box while Lily strips for them. When she asks him about the music, he tells her that it's a song he composed himself for a young violinist he once knew, a boy of infinite beauty and sensitivity, though he says this while gazing adoringly at Louis. Though he doesn't say the name, Lestat's talking here about his ex-boyfriend, Nicholas, who was his lover when he was human. After he became a vampire, Nicky was tortured to madness by some evil vampires, and Lestat tried to save him by making him a vampire too, but it didn't work, and Nicky's life ended pretty tragically. In the books, this is one of Lestat's most painful secrets that he never tells Louis in their life together, because they're both constantly terrified of the other mocking them for their vulnerabilities, and so they never communicate. But here, Lestat just tosses the info right out as a way to subtly tell Louis, hey, guess what? I like men too. Because Lily isn't here just for them to watch. Lestat wants a threesome. When Lestat sees Lily putting makeup on her nipples because she's insecure about the way they look, he compares her and Louis as misfit beauties, the outsiders at odds with society, which is what the vampire in Rice's work has always represented and why her fan base has always consisted of so many people from marginalized groups. In the show, instead of the vampire being a metaphor for the outsider, they've made it literal, and Louis is an actual outsider who becomes the target of the vampire. As Lily begins to undress Louis, he's uncomfortable with Lestat watching them, but Lestat uses his psychic powers to speak in Louis's head again, telling him how much he wants him. Lestat takes off his own clothes and joins in with them. Louis has another moment of gay panic, but Lily tells him it's all right and keeps herself between them. 
However, as soon as Lestat puts her to sleep with his vampire powers, Louis can't contain himself anymore and jumps on Lestat, finally giving in to the passion. They make out aggressively for a minute, and then Lestat turns Louis around and bites his neck, drinking his blood, but only a little, not enough to kill him, which we are told is very difficult for a vampire to do and takes enormous restraint and control, especially considering Lestat also levitates them a foot off the ground while he does it, because apparently he can fly now? In the books, flight is a power that only comes to very old vampires after hundreds of years or if a young vampire drinks excessive blood from one very ancient and powerful. Lestat doesn't get the power of flight until the third book, Queen of the Damned, in modern times, but just like in the 1994 movie, when he first bites Louis, he can now fly already. Maybe it's just something about drinking Louis's blood in particular that makes him feel like he's walking on air. Louis explaining to Daniel that the little drink is so hard to do for vampires preempts the obvious questions that will come up when he goes through his journey of not wanting to eat people. He won't be strong enough to have the restraint to do it himself, and this is the same way as he is in the book. When vampires drink, they drink to kill. And Anne Rice explained that for a vampire to resist killing someone is the greatest act of love they can display for a person. Louis describes getting his blood sucked as the most intimate experience of his existence, miles beyond any drug high, which Daniel can relate to as he listens to the story, because Daniel used to be a drug addict when he was young, a big reason why his first interview was so lacking. It's at this point that Louis explains that he's come to embrace his homosexuality. And he mentions that Daniel can relate to that too, considering that they met in a gay bar in 1973, which is how it happened in the book. But this version of Daniel shuts that right down saying, no, he was only at the gay bar to score drugs and he did what he had to do. That's right. This show straight washes Daniel. He's now had two wives and daughters and he was not at the gay bar for men. I don't get why the show has made this baffling choice. All of Anne Rice's vampires exist outside the constraints of human sexuality, but many of them were also queer as humans before they ever even became vampires. And in the books, Daniel slept with both men and women while he was human and fell in love with Armand. I can't even guess why the show would straight wash him for this grown-up version of his character. How much richer could this interview have been if they'd let Daniel stay queer? Back to Louis' story. After he has vampire sex with Lestat, he has another moment of gay panic and decides to never see Lestat again, ghosting him for weeks. During this time, Louis' sister gets married, and we get to see Louis having some happy, repressed times with his Catholic family. The show gives his sister's new husband, Levy, the last name of Frenier, which is pulled from the book, though from a different character than the man Louis' sister marries. In the book, we never actually know his name, or hers for that matter. In the book, the Freniers are a family that owns the plantation neighboring Louis, and they serve some minor plot points in Louis' early vampire life. But here, Levy doesn't serve those plot points at all. Freneer in name only, I suppose is just another nod to the source material. Does this count as an Easter egg? They're tossing them in where they can, I guess. The morning after Louis' sister's wedding, he and his brother Paul climb up to the roof of their mansion to watch the sunrise. Paul says some cryptic, things to Louis about hoping he and his sister will be okay. And then he walks right off the roof and face plants to his death on the ground. Louis is shocked and horrified. Paul's death is utterly inexplicable. Was it suicide? Did the birds tell him to do it? Did he even realize what he was doing? How mentally ill was he? It traumatizes the whole family. And because Louis was the last one with him, his mom blames Louis for triggering Paul's death, sending Louis into an even deeper guilt spiral. In the book, Louis has much more reason to feel guilt for his brother's death, though. Instead of having a sweet, loving talk like in the show, their last conversation is a horrible fight over Paul's religious mania, and Paul runs off upset and then falls down the stairs to his death, so Louis does actually feel responsible. The show, on the other hand, wants us to think that his guilt is misplaced, that he's feeling the shame and agony when he shouldn't, that his human existence is oppressing him unjustly, and the freedom of vampire existence would be preferable. Daniel takes a break from the interview here to give Louis a moment in his grief for his memories, and they talk about the nature of death. 
Louis says he's seen death so many times now that it's boring to him. Boring. Louis, bored of death to point du lac. <sighs> this is another big change from his character in the book who reveres humanity and wrestles with his murderous nature too deeply to ever consider death boring, to ever be so dismissive about it. He and Daniel compare his immortal life to the way the world is being plagued by the pandemic and how Daniel's days are numbered with his Parkinson's, but all Louis says is that he's bored. And this gives us another clue as to why he's doing this new interview now, which we'll get built upon later. He says Paul's death utterly destroyed him as a human, that his life was worth nothing, and this was the final straw in his existential failure. While the funeral march is going down the street, Lestat sneaks up on Louis, at first offering his condolences, but quickly shifting into demanding why Louis ghosted him. He says he spent the last weeks seeing Lily instead, but she was a poor substitute. It's Louis he wants. Louis gets pissed off and shoves him, and his burly assistant pulls Lestat away, but as soon as no one's looking, Lestat easily uses his vampire strength to snap the guy's arm and starts sending out psychic summons for Louis to come to him. Louis copes with this by getting drunk and stumbling through the rain, wallowing in his grief like the sad wet noodle man he is. He comes to the brothel where Lily works, drunkenly asking for her, and the madam tells him that she died, victim of the mysterious blood-draining disease that's been happening around town lately. Louis knows what that means, and Lestat's continued psychic beckoning sends Louis running to the church to go to confession. Here, he not only admits he's tormented over having sex with a man who he thinks is the devil and that he blames himself for his brother's death, but also all his guilt and shame over his life as a pimp, saying he knows how he's profiting off the misery of others, ignoring the plights of his prostitutes, and lying to himself by saying he's giving them good work when he knows the truth of how he's using and abusing people for his gain and how he's dragged his family down into this shameful life with him, screaming pleas to God for help, for how weak he is, saying he wants to die. I appreciate that the show is acknowledging the harmfulness of Louis' role in the sex work industry. Last year, uh, when we first learned that the show was changing him into a brothel owner, everyone was concerned how well it would handle the harmful black pimp stereotype, as well as the way it would frame the sex workers if they would be used as eye candy on the screen to titillate audiences and draw viewers in. But I did find the portrayal of the women much more respectful than I feared it might be. As Louis is pouring out his litany of self-loathing to the priest, of course Lestat is listening, and he reaches his limit in another explosion of his temper. He bursts into the church in fire and fury, snatching the priest out of the confessional and feasting on him like a wild animal, blood and gore everywhere. This is another big change from the books. Anne Rice made it very clear multiple times that her vampires never spill a drop of blood when they drink. Lestat can kill like lightning, draining a victim to a husk, but all the blood goes in his mouth, never on his face. But the show's decided that that would not make for iconic vampire TV, so we have blood everywhere now. Louis stumbles out to witness the scene, still very drunk, and immediately attacks Lestat with the same knife cane he pulled on his brother at the start of the episode. He stabs Lestat brutally three times in the back, but Lestat doesn't even feel it. He screams at Louis for humiliating himself by begging a god who doesn't exist and his charlatan priests for help, and throws him across the room. Louis asks him about killing Lily, and Lestat points out that her life as a prostitute was horrible anyway. Then, Lestat says he gives death to those deserving. I give death to those deserving. When I saw this line in the trailers before, I thought this was an indication that Lestat only kills evildoers, which is part of his character in the books. One of those things Louis got wrong in his first interview, but Lestat corrects in later books. One of those very things you'd think the showrunners were talking about when they said how much of the late canon Lestat they incorporated into his character in the show. But nope, it is not explained why he thinks the priest and Lily were deserving of death, and he kills pretty indiscriminately, regardless of how innocent his victims are. 
He tells Louis he's not the devil, but he can bring him death. But before he can elaborate, another priest stumbles onto the scene. The stat gives the most put-upon look ever and slows down time as the priest runs away to casually meander after him and then punch his fist straight through the guy's head. Now, is this technically something Lestat could do? Yes. Is it something he's ever done? No. Not his style. At all. But doesn't he look badass? Such a bad boy. God, this church is such a mess. Lestat's whole deal in the books is that he's not like the other vampires, feral beasts who lurk in the shadows. He's a gentleman vampire who can blend into society and never get caught. He doesn't leave a trace, but now there's fire and gore scattered all over this church, and even if he gets rid of the bodies, who's going to clean up those puddles of blood on the floor? Is he coming back here later with a roll of paper towels? This is just an utterly impractical move on his part. But anyway, he zooms back over to Louis, and one swipe of his sleeve is apparently enough to wipe off almost all of the blood covering his face, which is important because uh, he's about to have some really emotional close-up shots here, and that blood beard would have been a bit distracting. He also takes off his coat for some reason, and interestingly, uh, there's no knife holes in his back anymore. And then he makes his big Be a Vampire With Me speech, where he tells Louis he sees through all of the personas he has to put on in his sorrowful life and to the true nature of who he is beneath it. For the first time, Louis feels truly seen by someone, and Lestat tells him outright that he loves him for who that person is. He promises that by making him a vampire, he'll take away all of Louis's sorrow, and Louis can finally live free as his true unapologetic self with the power and immortality to compensate for all the powerlessness he's felt all his life by his place in society. We don't get to hear Lestat's entire speech as Louis' narration takes over, telling us that whatever Lestat's saying, his words disarmed him and made such a compelling argument for being a vampire that Louis couldn't do anything but say yes. In the book, we don't get to hear any of Lestat's speech, and the same went for the movie. In the book, it just says, From then on, I experienced only increasing wonder as he talked to me and told me of what I might become of what his life had been and stood to be, my past shrank to embers. So I was hoping that this time the show would give us the whole thing to really let us know just what the stat said about what his own life had been that was so perfect and filled Louis with increasing wonder. No throws, but I guess they felt like nothing could ever fully live up to Louis's description of it. So we only get the beginning and end of Lestat's speech. But Lestat does actually tell Louis outright, I love you. And then Louis, overcome and probably still pretty drunk, accepts his offer of the dark gift. He doesn't say he loves him back, but he does kiss Lestat quite romantically. This is the second time Louis initiated a kiss between them. And just like last time, Lestat then bites his throat, draining him to death this time before giving Louis his own blood from his wrist to drink. Louis's narration to Daniel over this scene of his transformation about hearing the pounding of drums of their two heartbeats is straight out of the book. And I just have to say that um, the switch between Roland Jones's dialogue and Anne Rice's prose is such a jarring contrast that it's, it kind of feels like Louis is suddenly speaking an entirely different language here. His dramatic monologue ends with saying, after it was done, he and Lestat sat there some time in throes of increasing wonder. There's our episode title drop. Throes usually imply something a bit more active, but yes, they are just sitting there in a church. Ooh, so sacrilegious, becoming a vampire in a church. Louis's eyes have now turned green, which is a nod to the characters of famous green eyes in the books. But unfortunately... The actor's contacts aren't very convincing. The contact lenses are one of my least favorite things about the show. I know they were trying to make the vampire's eyes eerie and alien, but the lenses are so distracting and frankly inhibit the actor's ability to emote. There were often moments where I know we'd be seeing like so much more emotion in their eyes if it weren't for the distracting contacts. What can you do when you have humans playing vampires on TV? You have to make them look different from the other humans somehow. So besides the context, they also have long, white, pointy fingernails. And then, of course, the fangs, but only sometimes. 
their fangs unsheath when they're aggressive, aroused, or about to eat. But unlike other vampire shows like True Blood, where the fangs literally pop in and out of their gums, the showrunners describe the effect here as something that's meant to be more psychological. It's not that the fangs actually disappear, it's more that the vampires are using their psychic powers to make our fragile mortal minds not perceive the fangs until they want us to. And it has the benefit of actors not having to lisp over false teeth for seven episodes in a row. Contacts, retractable fangs, bloody faces and messy eating, these are insignificant nitpicks that, of course, TV would have to change for its visual format from how they worked in the novel. The big change that fascinates me here is the difference in what the vampire means and how contemporary audiences will relate to the themes and metaphors of the show in this, the year of our Dark Lord 2022, compared to how vampire themes spoke to readers throughout the course of Anne Rice's 40 years of writing about them. We've got six more episodes to go and a lot more vampire meta to contextualize, but so far with episode one, the message that comes through is that the vampire represents freedom and acceptance, learning to love and value your true self and transcending the constraints of societal pressures, throwing off the hats and masks we're supposed to wear to embrace life without shame. The way it's compared to Paul's freedom of expression in his religious mania, the fact that Louis couldn't take communion at the funeral, which he calls transformation, but then drank Lestat's body and blood instead, and the fact that Louis's transformation happens in a church, we can take the empowerment of the vampire as a religious experience as well. But not a religion of the external, as a servant to any higher power. The church is on fire. The priests slaughtered. The blood is literal. This is a religion of the self, a transcendence that comes from within. And the empowerment of the vampire is that he is his own god, which I'm sure is going to go just great for Louis on his subsequent vampire journey. Can't wait. I am Zemaven of the Eventide, and I will see you again after episode two. was sponsored by my Patreon patrons. Thank you to everyone who subscribes to my Patreon. If you would like to help me make more of these videos, join my Patreon because I am making a video for every single episode of this TV show and my patrons get to watch it first privately before I make them public. So if you want to see these episodes ahead of time, bright and early, join my Patreon. The link is in the description. Otherwise, please tell me your thoughts and feelings on episode one. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Discuss amongst yourselves. I can't wait to hear what you all think in the comments, and I'll be seeing you again very soon.